OK. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker for this evening. It gives me great pleasure to um, introduce to you Dr. Dahi O'Coron. Dahi lectures in the School of History and Geography at DCU and is chair there of the MA in History. He's published widely on the Irish Revolution, 1912 to 1923, and Irish Catholicism. Dahi is the author of Rendering to God and Caesar, the Irish Churches and the Two States in Ireland, 1949 to 73 published in 2006, and chapters on Irish Catholicism in The Cambridge Social History of Modern Ireland, published in 2017, The Cambridge History of Ireland, 2018, and the forthcoming Oxford History of British and Irish Catholicism. He's co-editor with Professor Marion Lyons of the Irish Revolution, 1912 to 23 series, published by Fourth Courts Press. People will be familiar with that. These are the county histories that have been published over the last number of years. And his latest book, co-authored with Professor Eunino Halpin of Trinity College, is the landmark The Dead of the Irish Revolution, published last year by Yale University Press. And this evening, Dr. O'Coran will be talking to us on the topic of falling between the cracks of remembrance, who were the dead of the Irish Revolution, 1916 to 21. So over to you, Dahi. Thank you, Kiran, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you, Ron, first of all, for the invitation to speak to you this evening uh, and indeed for his kind words of introduction. So I might begin uh, with a personal anecdote. The very first fatality entries in the dead of the Irish Revolution, Con Keating of Carsevine, Charlie Monaghan of Belfast and Donald Sheehan of Newcastle West in Limerick, have been part of my interest in this period of Irish history since I was a child. All three lost their lives on Good Friday 1916, when their car took a wrong turn in Calorgla and went over the pier at Ballycasan outside the town, instead of taking the road to Carsevine on their mission to make contact with the Aud, the ill-fated German arms ship. I am from Calorgla and fortunately I had a succession of primary and secondary school teachers with a deep interest in Irish history. For that reason, I was always very aware that the first deaths associated with the 1916 Rising occurred in Kerry rather than in Dublin. But for all that, I knew, or I was told, relatively little about the men's backgrounds. Who were they? What did they do for a living? When did they become involved in the Irish Volunteers? And who did they leave behind when they died? One of the great strengths, I hope, of the dead of the Irish Revolution is that this kind of detail has been unearthed and assembled as far as the sources allow for at least 2,850 people, civilians, members of the Crown Forces, Irish volunteers and the IRA, whose stories have been recounted in its pages. Now, I mentioned the term at least uh, 2,850 because since the book was published last October, a few additional cases have been brought uh, to our attention. When we think of the Irish Revolution, we often focus only on the well-known events, the 1916 Rising, the Sullahead Beg shootings, Bloody Sunday, the Kilmichael ambush, the burning of Cork City, and so on. Of course, this is all very welcome because a wealth of new research and indeed critical perspectives have been brought to bear that facilitates a more informed understanding of these significant episodes. However, such well-known events are really just a snapshot of the human cost of the Irish Revolution. While I will focus this evening on those who died, death is just one rather crude measure of political violence in this period. And we should not for a moment forget other manifestations of violence, such as the physical and mental traumas that damaged people's life chances, or the wholesale destruction of property that ruined people's livelihoods and left them with nothing. Uh, we should also recall the sense of terror felt by many ordinary people during this period. Now this evening I have three broad aims. I want to discuss scale of lethal violence and some national and local trends. Secondly, I want to discuss how people died and at whose hand. And lastly, 
I want to explain how some of the individual stories of the dead were recovered and why I think this is important. Until the publication of The Dead of the Irish Revolution last October, there was no agreement on so vital a fundamental as the number of people who died, let alone their life stories or why they were killed. Dead of the Irish Revolution seeks to provide a comprehensive and authoritative picture of fatalities arising from political violence between the 1916 Rising and the end of December 1921. No such accounting and description of all uh, such deaths has ever previously been attempted. So the book endeavours not only to identify all those who died, but to describe, to analyse and to contextualise them individually. It also tries to follow the linkages between individual stories. So, for example, it's fairly common that uh, some members of the same family die at different times during the War of Independence. One example is the Brown family in County Kerry. John Brown was killed in, in an attack on Gorty Clay Barracks in April 1918. And wearing my Kerry hat, I would suggest that this was actually the opening shots of the War of Independence. Um, John's brother, Robert, was captured and killed by the Crown forces near the Wall in North Kerry in February 1921. An example closer to Offaly uh, is the Thormy brothers, James and Joseph from Moth uh, across the border in Westmeath. Where available, um, uh, Yunan and I have tried uh, to record as much life uh, data as possible. So things like place of death, or sorry, place of birth, occupation, age, religion, marital status, place of death, um, in as far as they can be established. All of that information is presented chronologically. And this allows you to see the grim day by day, week by week, and month by month human cost of the Irish Revolution, from Donegal to Wexford, from Antrim to Kerry. For the stories of the men, women, and children who died, we obtain, I hope, original insights into the nature of the Irish Revolution itself. Partially funded by the Irish Research Council, the dead of the Irish Revolution took its inspiration from the Magisterial Lost Lives Project on the Northern Ireland Troubles by David McKittrick, Brian Feeney, Seamus Kelters and Chris Thornton. Now the uh, dead of the Irish Revolution records at least 2,850 deaths. In terms of scale, the number of fatalities amounts to less than 10% of those Irish who died serving during the First World War. So that's one way of looking at the scale. Perhaps a better way of considering the scale of violence is to compare the 1916 to 21 period with that of the Northern Ireland Troubles from 1968. Lost Lives recorded a total of 3,720 deaths that occurred over a period of more than three decades. Even allowing for the major advances in medicine, surgery and treatment, the scale of the loss of life in the condensed five-year period between 1916 and 1921 continues to shock me. Fatalities have been categorised into four principal groups. Civilians, rebels or Irish military forces, police, mostly RIC, but also auxiliaries, black and tans, Ulster Special Constabulary and the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And lastly, uh, British Army fatalities. In terms of, of raw statistics or the ball statistics, so to speak, 504 fatalities occurred in 1916, the overwhelming number of these during and immediately after the rising. In fact, the bloodiest day in terms of body count during the Irish Revolution was the 26th of April 1916, on which date 83 deaths were recorded. Next uh, highest was the 10th of July 1921, with 34 fatalities. So there's a sort of a rush 
uh, by many IRA units just before the, the uh, truce uh, comes into operation on the 11th of July. And just in case you're interested, uh, Bloody Sunday, uh, perhaps the best known uh, date uh, during the War of Independence in November 1920, uh, 31 people uh, died on that particular date. Of the 504 fatalities uh, in 1916, 55% or 276 were civilians. 84 or 16% were rebels. 127 or 25% were British military and just 17 or 3.4% were police. And the vast majority of those um, were uh, killed uh, at Ashburn in County Meath. Now there were of course a number of fatalities with awfully connections. Julia Condren, a 44 year old mother of two was originally from Offaly. She was shot in the face on the 26th of April, when a bullet came through the window of her home in Summerhill in Dublin. One of the 17 police fatalities was Constable William Frith, a member of C Division, Dublin Metropolitan Police, who was originally from Clara. He was shot in the head by a stray bullet in Store Street Police Station on the 27th of April, and his remains were later buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin. Frith was actually not the only member of the Dublin Metropolitan Police with Offaly connections. Uh, Daniel Hoey from Road was one of the first uh, members of the DMP to be killed by Michael Collins's squad in September 1919. Between 1917 and the end of 1921, there were 2,346 fatalities. So of this number, over 900, 39% were civilians. Irish military fatalities accounted for just over 21% at 491. The police accounted for 22% at 523. And British military fatalities accounted for just under 18% at 413. Now there are a number of qualitative differences between deaths in 1916 and those in the 1917 to 21 period. There is a very high concentration of deaths during the rising, given the intensity of the street fighting in Dublin city centre. By contrast, in 1917 to 21, fatalities were spread out over an extended period where the level of violence fluctuated between and within counties and fluctuated over time. There is also um, very little evidence of targeted killing by either British or Irish forces, uh, apart from the summary executions of Francis Sheehy Skeffington, Tom Dixon and Patrick McIntyre by order of Captain Bohm Colthurst in Portobello Barracks, and of course the execution of the uh, rebel leaders after the rising. Contrast, 1920 and 1921, was a more explicit use of targeted state violence. Uh, to quote words of Sir Henry Wilson, chief of the Imperial staff, uh, to out-terrorize the terrorists. Another significant difference between 1916 and the later period was the uh, elimination of alleged informers. Now this has been deeply contentious and it's often shrouded in half-truths and confusion. At least 184 civilians have been identified as having been killed as alleged spies. So this is a huge total. Uh, it amounts to almost 30% of uh, civilian uh, fatalities. Now, one of those uh, was Patrick Birmingham, who was found on the canal bank uh, at Capon Kerr outside Tullamore on the 5th of May, 1921. He had been blindfolded. His hands had been tied behind his back and he had been shot four times. Now, as is often the case in these kinds of killings, the body was labelled uh, with the following notice. Convicted spy, spies and informers beware, Harry. The killing was carried out by members of the 2nd Battalion of the 1st Brigade. The following month, on the 18th of June, 
the Offaly IRA killed two other suspected spies, Thomas Cunningham and Michael Riley at Belmont. Both men had been um, serving, or they had been ex-servicemen. Mary Riley uh, told uh, a quarter sessions hearing at Burr in October 1921 that she did washing for the military officers in nearby uh, military barracks at Hunston House and notes were occasionally given to her husband to collect clothes for washing. This, she told the court, was uh, the only reason that she believed that he had been killed. And just to quote directly from her, now my husband is dead. I am left destitute as we uh, lived on his pension. My husband was shot because he was not a rebel, end of quote. But in the event, Mary Riley secured uh, compensation. So she, she secured £850 for herself and £600 for her four. Uh, for her four children. Now, in this sort of murky uh, area of the, the killing of spies, it's not always clear that those who were targeted were, uh, were actually involved in passing information to the ground forces. In some cases, the killing of alleged spies occasioned local revulsion. Uh, one of the best examples of this was the, uh, was the killing of Kitty Carroll in County Monaghan. Killing of uh, Richard and Abraham Pearson of Coola Crease with its agrarian and sectarian resonances uh, proved an embarrassment to the IRA in Offaly. And it's certainly something the IRA um, general headquarters was very, very conscious about uh, this uh, and, and had an overwhelming desire to ensure uh, that uh, sectarian uh, based uh, killings uh, were kept to a minimum. Another significant difference between 1916 and 1917 to 21 was the absence um, uh, of sectarian motivation uh, behind most of, of the violence. Uh, now, one last uh, distinction uh, might also be mentioned. So the number of women who died was considerably greater during the rising when they comprised 11% uh, of the total number of fatalities than uh, in the period 1919-1921, when they accounted for just 4%. Now, uh, the reasons for this, of course, uh, was that the um, violence during the rising was taking place in densely populated streets uh, where crossfire was a particular danger. Now, in the 1919-21 period, the majority of female deaths occurred uh, in Belfast and Derry bring sectarian disturbances. Now, the uh, unit of analysis that we used in the dead of the Irish Revolution uh, was uh, the county. Now, it's not a perfect um, unit of analysis, but there are very solid reasons for this choice. First of all, the county was the administrative unit for policing and the courts. It was also largely the unit used for elections. Furthermore, it helped to align the dead of the Irish Revolution with county-based research and published county studies of the revolutionary period. And finally, it also reflects the very strong attachment to county as an identifying allegiance in Irish culture. It is certainly imperfect uh, because comparison um, it, it can be difficult given wide variations in population between counties. Uh, indeed, within counties, different areas experienced different levels of disturbance, depending on the organization and the vigor of the contending forces and the strength of local support for or local opposition to uh, the IRA. Small or quiet counties, uh, one bad setback would more or less put an end to IRA activity in that county. One example of this can be found in Leitrim, with the deaths in March 1921 of six members of a newly formed active service unit at Selton Hill. In Carlow, uh, in April, uh, uh, an, uh, an active service unit was caught off guard while training at Bally Murphy. And in May, in Cavan, at Lapham Duff, uh, an active service unit uh, which was intended to invigorate the local IRA was captured almost intact. 
So that tended to have a disastrous consequence uh, in, in these quieter counties. In larger counties like Cork, for example, um, there was a greater facility to put setbacks behind them. Uh, so there were many setbacks, for example, in February and March uh, 1921 in Cork, but that did not uh, sort of derail IRA activity in that county. Another issue um, with, the, with using county uh, as a unit of measurement is that it can obscure concentration of violence within urban centres. So in Antrim, Dublin and Derry, fatalities were overwhelmingly in the respective cities of Belfast, Dublin and Derry. So you're probably uh, wondering at this point, uh, which counties were the most violent? And the answer is not going to surprise you. The most violent between 1917 and 1921 were Cork, uh, which accounted for uh, over 500 or just under a quarter of the total. Dublin, which accounted for 15% or 360 fatalities. Antrim, which accounted for 232. I'll say a little bit more about Antrim in a few moments. And Tipperary, which, which accounts for 158. The other end of the scale were counties like Fermanagh, uh, where there were nine deaths, Leash and Wicklow, uh, which uh, each uh, witnessed 11 fatalities. In both Offaly and, and neighbouring Kildare, there were 22 deaths apiece, while in Westmeath, uh, there was just one less, uh, with a total of 21. Now, if deaths due to the 1916 rising were included, then Dublin would easily move into first position with over 860 fatalities or 30% of the total. And again, as you would probably um, expect, Munster accounted for the largest number of fatalities, followed by Leinster, Ulster and Connacht. Now, one alternative way to sort of think about this data or to present this data is to measure deaths by head of population. And that gives us a sort of different picture. So in counties like uh, Tyrone, Cavan, Fermanagh, the number of deaths per 10,000 of population is less than three. In Offaly, it's about 4.5. And in Cork, uh, it's 17 per uh, 10,000 of population. Now, the dynamics of violence in the northeast of the island are quite distinct. 195 civilians were killed in intercommunal violence in 1920 and 1921. The great majority of these, Belfast. In many cases, it is difficult to be certain where responsibility for individual deaths lay. The killing of police officers, for example, by the IRA in Belfast was uh, relatively rare. Just 18 were killed in 1920 and 1921. Uh, and this is a very small figure, uh, certainly in comparison uh, with some areas in the South and the West. So of the 523 police killed between 1917 and 1921, the most treacherous county was Cork, and it was the most treacherous by some distance. Um, Dublin was uh, the next most dangerous uh, over 100 police, I should say, were killed uh, in, uh, in Cork uh, in this period. In fact, Munster is the most dangerous place to be posted as a policeman. So you have substantial numbers of police fatalities in Tipperary, uh, in Limerick and Kerry. So you have over 40 killings uh, in each of those counties and a slightly lower total uh, in Clare. Now, tensions in the North grew steadily during 1920 for a number of reasons. First of all, Ulster Unionist leaders were shocked by Sinn Féin's sweeping success in local elections. In Derry, for example, a nationalist mayor was elected for the first time in 1688. Even in the Unionist citadel of Belfast, over a third of the seats on the city council were won by Labour, uh, Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party. Secondly, the IRA campaign elsewhere on the island and the dislocation of law and order grew in strength during 1920. And the third reason 
uh, for uh, the uh, ratcheting up of tensions in the North was that the Unionist press published a steady stream of often wildly exaggerated scare stories of impending Sinn Féin assault. Now this rising political temperature was recklessly ratcheted up even further by Sir Edward Carson. In July 1920, he told a large crowd of 25,000 at Fanahi that Sinn Féin would not be tolerated in Ulster and that unionists would reorganize their own defense. Now the violence in Belfast was triggered by the shooting in Cork of Colonel Gerald Bryce Ferguson Smith. He was from a prominent unionist business family in Bambridge, which had links to the UVF. At the time of his death, he was police commissioner uh, for Munster. He became infamous uh, for uh, telling uh, police in the stole uh, that the more they killed, the more he would like them. His funeral on the 21st of July 1920 coincided with the return to work after the 12th of July holiday. When the violence uh, had abated, 18 people had been killed, hundreds had been wounded, and thousands of nationalists had been made homeless or jobless or both. A second wave of sectarian violence followed in August. It was also triggered by an IRA killing with a Cork connection. This time, District Inspector Oswald Swansea who had been implicated in the death of Thomas McCurtain, was assassinated by Cork IRA men in Lisburn. Now, ultimately, the violence, particularly in Belfast, allowed uh, the Unionist political leadership to obtain greater control of law and order in the shape of the Ulster Special Constabulary. Assigning responsibility for deaths uh, was not easy. Uh, but where it could be determined, we found that just over a thousand fatalities were attributable to the IRA, and about 1,096 were attributable to the Crown forces. One interesting finding concerns the language or the categorizations used in inquests and military courts of inquiry. Things like shot. While, temp while attempting to escape, or shot uh, for failing to halt when ordered. At least 75 Irish military personnel and 124 civilians were killed in this fashion. This demonstrates the Crown forces were operating with uh, quite lax rules of engagement. Um, there are sort of many examples uh, of where uh, civilians uh, suffer because of the laxity uh, of this engagement. One example uh, is the very sad case of Elizabeth Bray, uh, who was deaf. She was fatally wounded in Belfast in February 1921 for ignoring uh, a military order to halt. A surprising number, 32%, of Crown Force casualties were self-inflicted, so either death by misadventure or death by suicide. For example, uh, a Constable Morley, an ex-serviceman uh, from Surrey, joined the RIC in May 1920, and he was posted uh, to Clonbalogue uh, in Offaly. On the 9th of September 1920, he went to his room after breakfast, shot himself uh, through the mouth with his rifle. Um, some members of the Crown forces uh, die in various um, accidents. For example, two members of the Leicestershire Regiment died in a drowning accident uh, in November uh, 1916. The unfortunate Constable Timothy Murphy accidentally knocked a revolver off a shelf while making his bed in, in his diamond RIC barracks in August 1919. It, the weapon discharged and fatally wounded him. Well, so these sort of accidents also occur uh, to volunteers because uh, they, they are not necessarily uh, any better experienced when it comes to handling firearms. So Martin Hansbury, uh, a volunteer from Athenry, died when he accidentally discharged his own weapon while crossing a hedge in September 1917. Another 
interesting trend was that a par for just over 70, 52% of fatalities inflicted uh, by the Crown forces could be uh, interpreted uh, as dubious or having a question mark over them. And what I mean by this is that they kind of range from reckless disregard for civilian safety to uh, intentional cold-blooded killings. And just to give you a few examples, uh, Edward Campbell was crushed by an armoured car while waiting for a tram on O'Connell Street in Dublin in February 1921. Margaret Guinan from Carrowkeel and Offaly was killed by a military lorry outside at Lone. A horse was frightened by the same lorry and she fell from a cart and, and fell under the wheels of the vehicle. It's also worth bearing in mind that very few policemen, um, hardly any, uh, were sanctioned uh, for their activities uh, during the War of Independence. William Mitchell was the only policeman executed in June 1921 for murder uh, in the entire period 1916 to 21. Uh, he was involved in an aggravate, aggravated robbery uh, in Dunlavin uh, in Wicklow, in which Robert Dixon uh, the house owner uh, was uh, was killed. Now, at this point, I'm going to uh, say a little bit uh, about the sources um, that were used and, and what they tell us, and, uh, and and how this how this book was was put together. Now, the dead of the Irish Revolution draws on an enormous range of evidence. In fact, one of the biggest challenges was simply the abundance. Uh, of primary source material of relevance in archives in Ireland, Northern Ireland, Britain, and further afield. One of the principal aims was to utilize as broad a range of sources as possible. Republican sources, British regimental material, compensation records, police records, hospital and burial records, official sources, the local press, memorials and headstones, personal memoirs. Now, on the last point, the memoir literature of this very violent period is actually heavily skewed towards, the, towards nationalist or Republican fighters, with very few personal rem, uh, reminiscences by members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, by members of the Auxiliaries, um, or other British personnel. There's a similar silence in Ulster, uh, where, you know, very, or none uh, in terms of loyalists and, and Ulster Special Constabulary members, uh, very reticent uh, about what, uh, what they were uh, involved in. Now, particular use was made of the Irish Bureau of Military History Collection, which was first released in 2003, and more recently, of the enormous Military Service Pension Collection, which was first opened uh, in, 19, in, in um, 2014. Uh, and we've also tried to use um, civilian compensation records um, in, in respect of those civilians who were killed in 1916. The book benefited from the digitization of the 1911 census. As I mentioned, fatalities were broadly divided into four categories. And the available source material for each category uh, varies. Inevitably, some stories are better known than others, and therefore some entries have more depth and more context background than others. In recent years, the amount of primary source material pertaining to the Irish Volunteers and the IRA has increased almost exponentially with the availability of the Bureau of, Mil of Military History and the Military um, Service Pension Collection. One of the great research benefits of the pension collection is that parents or widows, many in horribly straitened circumstances, applied to the Irish government for a gratuity or a pension. And this has allowed us to get accurate information on the personal details of Irish military fatalities. So an individual's name, the age at which uh, they died, um, precise information as to their occupation, and so on. The pension collection has also helped to untangle some commonly reported accuracies. So let me give you, let me give you an example. 
So one of the best known IRA actions in County Down during the War of Independence was an ambush that went very, very wrong at the Egyptian Arch outside Newry on the 13th of December, 1920. The IRA party fired on a group of British military who replied with a machine gun. And this killed William Canning and had wounded three others. Two of those who were wounded later died. Several accounts referred to the subsequent death of Jeff, K-E-F-F, Hare. They did not give any other precise details. It took a lot of research to pinpoint how Hare died on the 5th of October 1921, so the best part of a year after the, the ambush. And furthermore, it took even more research to figure out his first name was not Jeff, as in J-E-F-F, uh, as some sources in the Bureau of Military History suggested, but, uh, but actually the initials J.F. for John Francis. Now that's only a small thing, but I think, it's, I think it's fundamentally important to get something as basic as an individual's first name correct uh, in a project of this nature. A similar way, researching police fatalities were some very reliable basic sources of information, such as RIC personnel registers and monthly and weekly police reports. Furthermore, the dead of the Irish Revolution benefited enormously from the pioneering research on the Dublin Metropolitan Police, Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, carried out by Jim Hurley and uh, Richard Abbott. Unfortunately, Jim's latest book on the Black and, and Tans uh, um, it came out just too late uh, to be of uh, to, to be uh, cross-checked uh, when we were preparing the Dead of the Irish Revolution. Compensation hearings are also really useful uh, in terms of personal detail um, and and uh, precision uh, around that detail. So, to take an awfully example, the mother of Constable Harry Biggs, who was fatally wounded during the Parkwood ambush in October 1920, received £650 compensation. But in making that claim, uh, we were able to uh, check some of the uh, personal details uh, for this woman's son. Researching British military fatalities, uh, there are wonderful records at a regimental level. Attestation and service records, medal information, sometimes there are unit histories, regimental journals and newspapers, and occasionally personal diaries. We also receive fantastic cooperation from a number of regimental museums, and in return, we shared information with them. But by some considerable distance, the available information on civilian deaths was meagre, even though civilian fatalities formed the largest category. Typically, civilians were innocent victims in the wrong place at the wrong time. The nature of the fighting during the Rising ensured a significant number of civilian deaths. Bridget Allen, a 16-year-old factory hand, was shot through the window of her home on Arran Quay on the 27th of April. On the same day, Jane Costello, a 23-year-old typist, went to the window of her lodgings in Seville Place to bring a lull in the fighting she took out the window was shot dead. Maliki Brennan, a 44-year-old labourer, was shot at the door of his wife's shop, leaving his unfortunate widow to raise her seven children. During the War of Independence, there were arguably increased dangers for the civilian population in terms of crossfire, explosions, reckless driving by the Crown forces, and indiscriminate, largely unregulated violence against civilians uh, by the forces of the Crown by day by night. Some of you would be familiar with W.B. W. Yeats's poem Reprisals, in which he evokes the shocking death of Ellen Quinn on the 1st of November 1920. She was fatally wounded while sitting on a wall outside her home in Kiltartan with her nine-month-old baby in her arms. The fatal shot came from a passing police lorry. To quote Yeats, where may new married women sit? and suckle children now. Armed men may murder them in passing by. Nor law nor parliament take heed. Then close your ears with dust and lie among the other cheated dead. 
For most civilians are not recalled in poetry. They're not recalled in stone in the form of monuments. There is, for example, no monument or account before the dead of the Irish Revolution of the death of three and a half year old William Fitzgerald. He was on Camden Street selling fruit with his mother Catherine on the 5th of February 1921, when two British military lorries were attacked by the IRA and a homemade grenade was thrown. The little boy, one of the youngest fatalities of the War of Independence, died because a grenade fragment penetrated his skull. Now, there are hundreds of similar heartbreaking stories of grieving families who quietly suffered the anguish of losing a son, a daughter, a grandparent, a father, a mother, a brother, or a sister. The deaths of 93 children, and by child, I mean someone between the ages of 15 and infancy, are recorded in the death of the Irish Revolution. Now, I had a, I had a debate um, with Joe Duffy about this. Uh, Joe, in his book, uh, defined a child uh, as, uh, you know, you could be 16 or 17 and be defined as a child. Uh, but really, um, the uh, contemporaneous uh, usage of the term uh, from 100 years ago, you're still technically a child in compensation terms, uh, but at 15, but you're not uh, when, you, when you're 60, because you're, you're, you're generally at that point expected to be uh, in, the, in the workforce. Now, um, in, in total, uh, during the Irish Revolution, uh, 1,195 of the 2,850, or 42%, were civilian. The respective figures for, for rebels, police, and British military fatalities was 20%, 19%, and 19%. So you're talking about twice as many civilians uh, as, the next, as the next category. So while it is a truism that civilians are always the losers, uh, in a war situation, as the figures suggest, is demonstrably the case during the Irish Revolution. Recovering their stories, most of which are not even recalled in historical footnotes, has been the most difficult, but also the most satisfying aspect of researching the dead of the Irish Revolution. As much as historians like to explain movements or historical processes, history at its most essential is about people and the times they lived in. For this reason, individual stories underneath the absolute fatality figures are deeply compelling and often, of course, deeply tragic. So just a, a few very brief words of conclusion then before I look forward to your questions. The end of the Irish Revolution makes us think more deeply about this grim period and the scale of human loss and suffering that went side by side and day by day with the often simplistic narratives of heroic national struggle. The detail and the complexity of the stories recorded, I hope, uh, will help to break down and to undermine some of the more simplistic historical narratives. Now, this new light may indeed be uncomfortable and it might puncture some ingrained uh, local myths. But collectively, individual stories all dead of the Irish Revolution, ordinary men, women and children, rebels and the members of the Crown Forces provide us with an immeasurably richer and more informed, somber, often deeply stark understanding of that troubled time. Thank you very much.